It's time for Talking Pictures Trivia! A quick friendly reminder, water is not a protein. Welcome to Talking Pictures Trivia, the podcast in which a group of geographically challenged friends explore movies through trivia as an excuse to keep their friendships alive. I'm one of these friends and today's host, Nick, and with me is... Tom. And KJ. Great to have you back as always. Additionally, joining us as a guest for this episode is... Doug. Great to have you back, Doug. Doug is a longtime friend of ours going back to elementary school. You may remember Doug from our first episode, Raiders of the Lost Ark, as well as Solaris, American Graffiti, and our trio of shorts episode. It's great to have Doug back once again as we jump into some Best Picture nominees. Doug still conveniently likes movies. For those joining us for the first time, we start off each episode with a movie quiz as these pivotal questions will determine who earns today's trivia crown. Then, once the fierce competition is over, we follow it up with our famous movie rant, Where Anything Goes. KJ, tell us about today's movie. Today, we are going back to 1993. IBM suffers a $4.9 billion loss. The Buffalo Bills lose yet another Super Bowl. Intel releases the Pentium processor. And Rocco's Modern Life debuts on Nickelodeon. During all this, Steven Spielberg releases Jurassic Park. But today, we are talking about Andrew Davis's the Fugitive. Andrew Davis has directed Steven Seagal in Above the Law and Under Siege. With two Steven Seagal movies under his belt, Andrew went on to direct The Fugitive, which was nominated for Best Picture. This episode and our next two episodes, we will be exploring movies that were nominated for Best Picture. The Fugitive went up against In the Name of the Father, The Piano, and The Remains of the Day. But the winner for Best Picture that year was Schindler's List. Nick chose The Fugitive from all the nominees since 1929 and will be quizzing us today. Nick, what is The Fugitive all about? Yes, you are correct. Out of all of the movies in history that were nominated for Best Picture, I chose The Fugitive. And there's some reasons. I'll talk about the plot in a second. But I have a vivid memory of watching The Fugitive in theaters. I was, for some reason, in Vermont during the summer at the age of 10 with my aunt and my parents for some crazy reason. I think we were exploring some places my aunt used to go to escape the city in the summer. It was some kind of a program to get uh, city kids into the country. Well, the reason I bring this up is they wanted to see a movie. And the movie they wanted to see was The Fugitive. And here my whole life, I thought The Fugitive was the first rated R movie that I had seen in theaters only to find out when we do this episode that it is rated PG-13. So it is not the first rated R film I had ever seen. Apparently that still was a big deal. I didn't want to go see an adult-oriented film because I was into cartoons and stuff like that, I guess, at the time. So that was a revelation to me preparing for this episode. But more to the story. Dr. Richard Kimball is convicted of killing his wife even though he swears it wasn't him, it was the one-armed man. He escapes from death row after a freak bus getting hit by a train accident and goes to Chicago to prove his innocence. The U.S. Marshals, led by Deputy Marshal Samuel Gerard, are hot on his trail. Did Dr. Kimball kill his wife? Was there a one-armed man? Find out shortly. Tom, if you only had one word to describe the fugitive, what would it be? Detective. KJ, what would your word be? Quippy. Doug? Persistence. And my word would be suspenseful. It's time for question one. When you have a fugitive on the loose and set up a six mile perimeter, assuming the average foot speed barring injury is four miles per hour over uneven ground, what are the primary structures you anticipate your team doing a hard target search on within that area? This is going to be an around the room question. Each person is going to identify a structure until we run out of places. We're going to start with Doug. I'm going to start with the outhouse. Outhouse is on the list. KJ. Bridges? KJ is no longer in this round. <laughs> oh, it wasn't outhouses, bridges, and everything else. Wait, 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 wait. Don't ruin it for the rest of the them. Tom? <laughs> Gas station. Correct. Uh, hen house. That is on the list. Residence. That is also on the list. Uh, Barn? 
Oh, can you be more specific? Barn house. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, I, just re- I just remember hen house. Uh, Tom, Tom, you, you got one for me? I do. I could. You want me to list the rest of them? Go for it. Uh, farmhouse, outhouse, warehouse, doghouse. Yes. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, yes. I Barnhouse was very close to Farmhouse, mm-hmm. but I couldn't <laughs> give it to you. So I just thought this would be a fun way to start off. And the reason I did this is the opening credits continue to roll through the first 14 minutes of this movie as we get through the meat of his uh, tragic loss of his wife as well as his conviction. And I really wanted to focus on how this movie just jumps right into high stakes. Yeah, it's very economic. I mean, it's a movie, it's about, what, 2.10, two hours, 10 minutes. And we're in the the the, tra- the uh, bus crash prison break thing occurs. It's like 15 minutes into the movie. And so we get the, the backstory to the murder, all of the clues as to why he's, he's guilty, the conviction, and then him being sent away all within in 15 minutes. It's... You know, it's very speedy. I think it's also uh, kind of relying on the fact that this was the most popular television show. At least it's it's uh, season finale was in like the history of the 1960s. Um, and so you could just sort of, you know, it, it you could just uh, use that kind of cultural memory to propel your, yourself forward. But it is pretty economic storytelling up front anyway. See, I'm a big fan of this film, but I actually didn't have any familiarity with the source material. And I always loved how you jumped right into this film. And I was watching it thoroughly this time, of course, for this episode. And that's when it hit me. We're still doing opening credits 14 minutes in. And and that trial, and I was talking with my wife when we watched it, that trial would have taken a lot of time. Nope, zoom, it's done. You're convicted. You're going to death row, lethal injection. Let's see if uh, somehow you can escape and see if you're innocent. Yeah. In, in the original, Tom, have you, have you seen the original? The I've 60s? seen bits, bits and pieces of it. I, I've read more about it than I've seen of it. Is is there a Tommy Lee Jones? Yeah, as... there's a Gerard. Mm-hmm. I, well, right. But is he as, as quippy and as... No, the, the Gerard is much more kind of stoic. He's, uh, I, I think the reason why his name is Gerard is that it, it's... Uh, you know, the, this French name probably taken uh, or, or a reference anyway to um, uh, uh, Javert from Les Miserables. Uh, but Javert is like, a, hmm. like, I don't care. The law says you're guilty, therefore you're guilty. And I will follow the letter of the law. Um, you know, he's not this like fun, sort of loose character the way uh, Tommy Lee Jones plays it. Hopefully we'll get the Snyder cut of Les Mis where Tommy Lee Jones plays Javar. That would oh, be. Oh God! Imagine, imagine the Snyder cut of Les Miserables. Les Miserables <laughs> is already forty-five hours long. How could you know? Imagine doubling that. That would be. That would kill me. That would. That would be my lethal injection. By the way, that iconic scene where he does say, "I don't care," in the tunnels beneath the dam was actually ad-libbed. It was a, a change by Tommy Lee Jones that was not in the original script. A lot of this is ad-libbed. A lot of the script is kind of um, made up as they're going. Apparently they had a fairly poor relationship with the, the screenwriter. And I think that's why this movie is uh, kind of works as well as it does. I think why it's so kind of, um, the the, uh, the the marshals are so sort of bubbly and enjoyable to be around, even though they're still highly competent people, is a lot of this is just kind of uh, made up on the day and it works really well. Now, do you think the speed, the pace worked? Um, I think it, it worked. Uh, it, well, from the title, I think, I think you know he escapes, so you, you can't spend too much time. I was shocked. <laughs> yeah, you can't spend too much time on... Uh, you know, whether he's going to get arrested. And I, I think all that stuff is a given. So you, you do have to kind of push past that part uh, pretty quickly. Yeah, the pacing of this movie is fantastic through the whole thing. I, I had forgotten how much I like this movie. It It is such a fun ride. I'm surprised it was nominated for Best Picture. Um, unless there's more homages to like The Third Man and other hard-boiled movies that i missed but i i was kind of surprised 
that it was uh, nominated. KJ, would you say it's suspenseful? Um, I have to think about that because do we first watch, hmm. not a rewatch? You know what I mean? Like, well, did you think Tommy Lee Jones was going to catch Harrison Ford? Because if not, then I don't think it was suspenseful because he kind of knew he wasn't gonna. But he did. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with no consequence. Yeah. Okay. I'd have to think about that one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of read it as a uh, kind of an action movie meets a detective movie. And it's very much, you know, he's the detective and it's very unconventional in the sense that he's also hiding from the police, but he's putting together these clues and it has that kind of, you know, structure. And, and we're also introduced to uh, enough of the we're introduced to the guilty party very early on in that kind of Agatha Christie way where we meet all of the possible suspects. Um, even though he's not directly responsible for Helen's murder, he, he's the orchestrator and we meet him early on. And so the movie does feel like a detective story. I don't see any specific homages to um, kind of hard boiled stuff. Um, so there's the sewer scene where instead of using shadows, they use like focus beams of light. Right, right. Felt third manish. Yeah, good, good, good and call. And then um, the one armed man was chasing him, and it probably wasn't the same set, but it looked like it could have been the same set as the French Connection. Um, yeah. And th that 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 whole the whole sequence where the one armed man is chasing Harrison Ford felt very French Connection to me. Yeah. So I didn't yeah. know if there was other movies I was missing. If this was just a string of you know, really fun. Yeah, I, I didn't, it's like the third man, the tunnel scene in the third man is very expressionistic and this movie is kind of straight realism. Um, there, There isn't, it's hard to talk about this director because there isn't a lot of style to this movie, I would say, in the way that, um, you know, the, the, those other films have style. But I, I see what you're saying. I th maybe there are, maybe that tunnel is a is a kind of tacit. It's time for question two. How many confirmed lives does Dr. Richard Kimball save during The Fugitive? Uh, it, it depends. Uh, there's one I could add, but I, I'm not sure. I, I'm going to lock in four with, I, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to lock in. <laughs> I want to explain one because I don't know if we can call it confirmed. I'm going to lock in. Locked in. Okay. Tom seemed pretty eager, so I'm, I'm going to let him start this one off. I, I'm not entirely confident, but as you know, I think the answer is four. So it's the the young boy who was a football player. Um, there is the the guard who who he pulls out of the bus when, before the bus hits. There is the um, Gerard he saves at the end when he hits him with the pipe to to stop the the Dutchman from shooting him. Um, and then the, the, the fourth one, um, I, I'm going to say the other prisoner because he gives him the keys to get out of the bus. And I, I don't know if we call that confirmed, but this guy does not get out of the bus without getting out of those handcuffs. Okay. Uh, it was close on the next one. So I'm going to go Doug. So I had three in mind, and those were the first three that Tom mentioned. Okay. KJ, where do you stand? I had four, and they were different. So that's Let's hear it. an issue. Yeah. So the young no, boy. Well, actually, the question is the number. Is so... the number, right? All right. Yeah, so let's hear it. Well, so the young boy that Tom mentioned, the guard, um, right? Like, you know, tell the doctors to look at his. Da -da 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 -da. Um, <laughs> The prisoner, I also had Tom. And then at the beginning of the movie, we see him doing surgery. And I didn't know if that counted as a save. Oh, maybe. <laughs> so the points are going to go to KJ and Tom, one point each. The four lives that I had were actually KJ's. There was a 58-year-old man who was bleeding out after his gallbladder was removed because he was on the wonder drug RDU-90, later known as Provasic. And that was not helping the way it was supposed to. So they called in Dr. Kimball, even though Dr. Lentz was the one on call. Uh, it was his patient. Uh, and he saves this guy from bleeding out. The police guard on the bus, that's everyone got that, the boy in the hospital, and saving Gerard from Dr. Nichols at the end. 
Let's talk about the portrayal of the fugitive, Dr. Kimball, from the get-go and moving through the film. He is a, a fairly standard action hero star in the sense that if you, uh, in, in, this, in the moral sense, in the fact that he always does the right thing and he's highly competent in kind of these tense, tense situations. He's also an action star because he gets away with these kind of amazing physical feats. So that, that's added on. But you can't be the, the action protagonist unless you're also like um, willing to take risks in order to do the right thing as well as being competent. We talk about this a lot, I guess. If films tend to divide up characters based on competence and incompetence, which is also why we like Gerard and we don't like the Chicago police, right? Um, but I, I think that's that's where Kimball is kind of your standard. You, you kind of a little more standard than, um, I don't know, that, that may be a more subtle character, but whatever, I don't mean to be judgmental, but that's what I'm saying. So I guess he's standard, but. I think if, if he was a D&D &D character, his charisma would be his high role. So he gets out of a lot of situations because he's, he's kind of like a beetle with his charisma. There's a lot of time when Ford's old man yet boyish look like gets him through a situation, whether it's, uh, you know, the, the, when she takes the badge from him, he's able to walk away and it, there was, she didn't pursue him further on the spot because he seemed harmless and kind of fun and when they ask him, like, have you seen a six foot man with blah, 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 blah. And he's like, every day in the mirror, like I minus the beard. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but then again, that's what it, that's why you hire a movie star. That's why action movies tend not to be indie, right? Cause you have the big star and the big star kind of fills in the outline with his or her charisma. But a lot of other action stars are cocky. He was, I, I yeah. would also say okay. he leads yeah, yeah, yeah. if, if we're going to stick with yeah, the D&D yeah. &D reference, I'd also say his intelligence is pretty high as well. Sure. Because mm -hmm. if I was in that same circumstance, I'm not a doctor, okay? I have a big gash in my side. I'm in trouble, you know, whereas he could sneak into a hospital. He knows his way around the medicines. He's, he's very resourceful, mm -hmm. even though that wouldn't have been part of his daily life um, in a pretty cushy lifestyle. If you saw, they, they were pretty well off and... And he was able to adjust and adapt to this environment. So I would say charisma is definitely up there as well as intelligence. His strength, which you see in a lot of other action films, really wasn't one of the highlights here. I mean, there are some things, but his resilience. Um, his stamina, right? His constitution. His stamina. Mm -hmm. constitution, yeah. I mean, and he's got some good luck getting jumping off that dam, but that's another, that's, that's a different type of role. <laughs> so, yeah, I would say he doesn't fit the mold when it comes to the broody action film guy. In fact, this was one, if not the only action film he was in where he did, his character did not take a life. So he did not take any, he did not kill anyone in this film. Who did he kill in Air Force One? Didn't he throw Gary yeah. Oldman out of the plane? Yeah, yeah. Plane. No ticket. No, but seriously, it's one. It's one of the one, if not the only. There's a few, maybe, but yeah, I, I think like yeah, his competence is what what makes him admirable. You know, he's he's good at what he does. I mean, he becomes this detective pretty, pretty smoothly. After round one, Tom is in the lead with two points. KJ has one point and Doug is still with us, but everything in round two is worth two points. So it's anyone's game. We'll be right back after this quick break from one of our sponsors. All right, Tom here again. And here is another testimonial I was asked to read. Uh, the, the person who wrote this has signed the Black Knight. I don't know what that means, but I'm, I'm just going to read this. So... Here we go. When the sun goes down and all the world is bathed in the cool glow of a sexy full moon, I know to be on alert. I guard the bridge between this world and the one beyond. Very often, very sexy travelers attempt to storm the bridge in hopes of finding salvation in the place beyond this mortal coil. I sexily defeat them and cast their not very sexy torsos into the canyon of sorrowful travelers. But when Lancelot du Lac, 
sexy, proud knight of the round table, approached. My sword had no effect on him. Why, you may ask. He was probably wearing Larry Muck's sword repellent. Just cover yourself in Larry's musk, and no sword whatsoever can do you damage, and you'll be able to go directly to paradise. Larry Musk's sword repellent. It's a product. And we're back. Doug, we're at the critical part of our episode where we ask the guest a key question. If you could watch this movie with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be? So my answer is going to be Joe Pantoliano, uh, a.k.a. Cosmo Renfro, the uh, comic relief of the movie. Um, he, I think he's, uh, he's pretty funny, and he's often the comic relief in a lot of other movies, whether he's playing good guy or a bad guy. So I think it would be fun, and I, because I didn't want to pick uh, Harrison Ford, <laughs> like the usual. <laughs> I watch every movie with Harrison Ford and he hates watching it. Yeah, so that's an interesting one. In fact, his character Cosmo Renfro in this movie was supposed to be killed, but he actually pleaded with them to keep him alive in case they ever made a sequel, which they eventually did called U.S. Marshals. So that's a, an interesting take. I'm sure, you know, Doug, don't you think he's the kind of guy who might talk over a movie though? I feel like he would be that guy. Probably. You know? Yelling at the screen. Yeah, but I've seen this movie already, so it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's ready for a vacation anyway. Joey Pants. <laughs> <laughs> the only other movie I I think I recognize him from is The Matrix. So when he showed up in this one, I immediately didn't trust him. I was like, right. I, I know your game. So if I was sitting there watching a movie with him, I would have one eye on, on Joey Pants because I'd just be nervous about... I don't know that the scene where he pulls the the switch out of people's out of the neck and they die. I still I don't think I can forgive him for that. He, he was also to... in the Goonies. Uh, he was one of the the brothers, I think. Oh, yes, for Telly yep. brothers. Yes. Wow. He's also a memento. He's a pseudo bad guy, kind of sidekick. I don't know. You know. But U.S. Marshals was a rough movie. That was not a good. I don't remember it. That's the one with yeah. Wesley Snipes and they're chasing him. And I don't really remember. I watched it. I just, I don't remember anything else about it. It was not as memorable as The Fugitive, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And I still enjoyed the same level on this rewatch. Yeah, my, my memory of U.S. Marshals was better than the rewatch. <laughs> Did you re watch it recently? Yeah, just, how, how could that be? Today. <laughs> I wanted, I wanted oh, to oh, see okay. <laughs> But uh, yeah, well, I, I mean, I think the plot of both movies is a little convoluted, but U.S. Marshals is even worse. It's a little, yeah, just like too many twists and turns, but it did have Robert Downey Jr. in it. So that was fun. That's yeah. right. I did. Yeah. yeah. Where, where did you find this plot convoluted? Yeah, I like this plot. No, was it, you know, what, what was the, uh, the convolution? Well, the, I, don't, I don't know if I, I don't want to jump into potentially ruining some questions but the whole setup on how the murder happened like all the circumstances that went mm -hmm. into it and then you know mm -hmm. the whole um the motive and then the red herring and stuff like that mm -hmm. and it's all because of a drug <laughs> it's time for question three in how many scenes do Dr. Richard Kimball and Deputy Marshal Samuel Gerard directly share dialogue? Do they have to both talk? In how many scenes do Dr. Richard Kimball and Deputy Marshal Samuel Gerard directly share dialogue? You can share dialogue by listening. <laughs> what's your definition of dialogue? I was gonna say, what's your definition of share? If I give you a cookie and you don't give one back, <laughs> did we share? Dialogue means two people. Otherwise, it's a monologue. Yeah. Yes, okay. it has to okay. be. Dialogue means two mm -hmm. people. Good, good, good. I didn't realize that. Die. <laughs> okay. Directly share monologue. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm locked in. I'm locked in, too. 
I have a number, but I I just want to add one because I feel like I'm I'm coming in short. All right, locked in, locked. KJ, starting you up. All right, I have you could just say the number. You don't no, have no, to. I'll, I'll spell them out. So I have three uh, in the sewer. Right, it was short, but there was dialogue. There was a phone call where they review their sewer conversation, and then in the car at the end. Okay, Doug. Well, I was also going to say three. Um, my third one was different. Uh, I, I guess I have to stick with my original answer because I locked it in three. But, uh, my, <laughs> That's the locked in policy. Yeah, but my third one was right, Tom. <laughs> uh, so, so my third one uh, was after um, Kimball knocks out um, Nichols and uh, they say, I forget what they say uh, to each other, but uh, uh, Gerard says he needs the rest. I also had three. I I also had the the calling on the telephone. I don't know if they're sharing a scene, but they they talk to each other. The the obviously the tunnel where they first meet, um, and then the car at the end. Kimball says something, and they like kind of laugh, and and Gerard takes the handcuffs off of him. I didn't think Kimball said anything when he knocks out Doctor Nichols. I know Gerard says, you know, I, I kind of need the rest. I don't think Kimball says anything. And on the stairs, they also meet leaving the the prison. Uh, uh, and I also don't believe Kimball says anything there either. So I'm also going to go with three. Okay. No one will receive any points for this question. Yeah. There are four scenes. The tunnel in the dam, which everybody, I believe, shared mm -hmm. that one. Most, if not all of you, said the phone call at Sykes' house, the one our mm -hmm. man's house, that they did share dialogue. It was mm -hmm. not monologue. It was a two-way exchange of discourse. The laundry in the hotel, they actually did exchange. It was something to affect him, like reassuring that he didn't kill his wife. And this time, it's actually a pretty Im impactful scene. Tommy Lee jo Jones says he knows that he didn't do it. So that was the other one. And then in the car, in the U.S. Marshal vehicle, they also had an exchange about him not caring and he doesn't care and he still takes off his handcuffs and gives them the ice. So those are the four. You all kind of got there, but not together. The reason I brought this one up was I really wanted to explore the major part of this movie, that cat and mouse game between the fugitive and law enforcement, how that played out throughout the film. Yeah, he's not a stoic detective, uh, Marshall Gerard. So he's a lot of fun to watch because he 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 has the, the companionship between the group is, um, you know, it, it's very in, enjoyable to to watch, I guess. Uh, and it's it's fun to watch Gerard pick up the the breadcrumbs that Kimball starts leaving for him. Once Kimball can kind of put together who did the actual murder. Um, you know, then then Gerard can can pick up that trail. Um, but the, I mean, the performance on on Jones's part is is just a lot of fun. He um, he has a sense of irony in in the role that um, that isn't typical or isn't usual. He's sort of able to um, kind of say his lines, you know, deliver them in in terms of what they're what objective they're trying to reach while at the same time kind of spinning them in a humorous way it, it's really fun to watch him uh, whenever he's on screen he actually won the academy award for best actor in a supporting role for this film and the funny part about that is while they were making it Tommy Lee jones said to joe pentaliano it's not like anyone's going to win any awards for this <laughs> film <laughs> and then he ended up winning <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad he had all those minions to dish out whenever he needed them right he would been it would have been he wouldn't have worked on his own like he had too many good ideas and uh, this is going nowhere i'm gonna cut this i was just trying to... <laughs> I, I was just gonna say who would he had to check out all those bridges <laughs> yeah all the bridges the bridge house <laughs> tunnel house yeah my covered bridge <laughs> yeah i mean they're covered also bridges. they're also kind of on his uh on his level right i mean um you know th they're they're not like dummies and he's no, the smart no, no. one they're right? incredible they're all... at their job or else he yeah. wouldn't have them with him yeah. right? when he gives he 
requests pretty ridiculous things sometimes. And almost mm -hmm. every single time they come back with either what he was looking for or that led them to something. You really yeah. did get the sense that this is a crew that's worked many cases together and is a well-oiled machine. They may be slightly dysfunctional, but they all have their role and they execute their specific role for the team. That is sometimes tough when you're not properly introduced to these characters. It's not like we got the lineup and they said this guy and had underneath his role or anything. We just assumed that they were part of this cohesive unit. Yeah, and they're fun. Like I like when he, when Joe Pantaleone's character, uh, Pantaleone's character, kind of goes into the sewer. He's like, "I just bought these shoes," you know, <laughs> you know that type. Well, of they thing. all had that stuff. Even uh, the other guy, Hinky. You know, what's Hinky? They all had their like little mm -hmm. weird idiosyncrasies. Yeah. It also felt like a French Connection. You pick your feet in Piccadilly. You pick your feet in, or is it Poughkeepsie? You pick your feet in Poughkeepsie. You pick like that Hinky scene sounded mm -hmm. kind of like a thing cop says sometimes. Yeah, it's it's like it's like tough guy talk, right? That's kind of what the hard boiled thing is, and why this has so much kind of resonance with detective stories. Even though I don't, I don't find it stylistically hard boiled, um, but there is a little bit of a. It's like you know, it's it's a softer movie softer than hard boiled. That. <laughs> yeah, it's a softer hard boiled. Uh, you know, they're, over they're, easy. You know. Everybody's a little nicer. You, you're not also you're not really getting a CD Chicago. When we go into the city of Chicago and we get like the the other prisoner who escapes and we go into his house and he gets shot and, you know, I don't bargain. Um, no, I don't miss too. Right? Yeah. <laughs> he says he, both, I think. Oh, I think he's I thought he says I don't bargain. Can you hear me? Uh, I don't know oh, that Whatever. part. You're absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. But you're right. It, it, I mean, that's the that's kind of the the limit of seediness we get or the drug dealer. Um, mostly this is interesting because it is, you know, kind of a a. Um, a white collar crime story. And so the the hard, you, you don't really need the movie to be hard boiled because you're not dealing with hard boiled people. You're really dealing with, with the elites of this, you know, this second city. It's time for question four. What did Provasic, also known as RDU-90 in its early trials, do? Locked in. Locked in. I guess I'm locked in. <laughs> Doug, you know I'm starting with you. <laughs> What's up? I think it had something to do with blood clotting. So I want to say it's prevented blood clotting. I believe it damaged the liver. And I intentionally just said damaged the liver so that you had to decide if that was specific or not. <laughs> <laughs> I also said damaged the liver. Uh, it, I don't know what it does to help people maybe it's something with with blood clots my guess is it is because that guy bled out in the in the beginning of the movie but the liver samples were damaged well the liver samples were replaced right they were they yeah were... and then replaced <laughs> they, they, they came back damaged <laughs> <and then> they... <laughs> my yeah i know it prevents invasive surgery so it does something to prevent invasive surgery and that thing hurts your liver Oh, that's a different answer. <laughs> Not really. I didn't really give you so, an answer in terms of it's positive. It just says it does so, something. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the deal. Um, technically, Provasic, while it was known as RDU-90 in its early trials, it did damage people's livers. So I am going to give the points to Tom and KJ. However... I'm also going to say what the real answer is for our listening audience. Provasic is a drug produced by Devlin McGregor Pharmaceuticals, which was announced as a non-invasive treatment for arterial plaque, one that would reduce the risk of heart attack and other heart problems. So uh, it reduced the risk of arterial plaque. Arterial plaque. I should have known it. <laughs> <laughs> the, hell, the hell is arterial plaque? <laughs> it's a buildup. It's a buildup of plaque. Oh, it's pretty okay. serious in the 90s. It's not a good thing. Uh, it's, not, it's not a good <laughs> Let's put it this way. It's not a good thing if, you, if, you're, if your arteries can't have blood yeah. flow. Let's just put it that way. Doug, what was yours? You said it about said blood, blood clotting. clotting. So I don't think that's the same thing as, well, I don't know exactly what. No, it actually is supposed to is prevent there. blood from clotting. Is the opposite. Yeah, that's what you were that saying is. that it allowed blood to clot. No, I said uh, prevented. I'm pretty sure I said prevented. But, oh, um, well then you also get the point. 
points. <laughs> okay. Uh, Did he say prevent or it cause blood clotting? No, he didn't clotting. say cause. Doug, Doug was like, that's something with blood clotting. I, I thought I said prevent, but... Okay. Um, Audience who's paying better attention than we are tweeted us on Twitter. <laughs> if Doug said, <laughs> "Well, based on this revelation, everybody gets the points for this one." <laughs> I'm least happy to give the points to KJ because he went on a technicality, <laughs> but <laughs> but everyone gets it. Now you may ask, why am I asking about Provasic? The reason I am is that's the whole plot device for this film. The reason Dr. Kimball's wife got killed, it was supposed to be him, was because Dr. Nichols was greedy and wanted to make a lot of money by approving Provasic. He's on the board of the directors at Devlin McGregor, and that's the reason this all happened. So I, I thought it was important to highlight why we're even along for this ride. It was perfect for the rest of the movie, right? It got out of the way. It got... Uh, Tommy Lee Jones chasing Harrison Ford, and that's what we wanted to see. It didn't get bogged down in other kind of details or silly things. So Kimball doesn't find this out until much later, but they've already switched the samples. He didn't know about it until he did all that research later. So I don't see why they needed to try and kill him in the first place. They just kind of you know, falsified his data anyway. I think there is a big time jump in the movie that we're not privy to because it happens during the court. Lentz is alive during that party, okay? Then later we find out Lentz, Dr. Lentz died and the samples were swapped, This almost half the samples were swapped the same day he died. So there was scenes where they talked about Dr. Kimball was afraid that it was going to affect the liver because remember we were talking about the uh, person who was on the medication and it was bleeding out. He has he puts a little jab in there about the wonder drug, and so Lentz is overseeing it, right? The the, the tests. Yeah, he's and the one who Lentz, can sign off on the samples. And Lentz replaces the samples. No, Doctor Nichols replaces that, the samples after Lentz he's the dies. Only other, yeah, he's the only one but, who has access aside from Lentz. But Lentz dies. The samples are replaced later. Um, and Lentz also is the connection to Sykes, the killer. Yes. Right. And so, and they imply that, at least I felt they implied that Dr. Nichols also, or Devlin McGregor, whoever you want to look at it, also offed Lentz because he died in a mysterious way. He was jogging and got hit by a car. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was. Just, and then suspiciously, the same day, half the samples changed. Yeah. So one thinks they're just taking people out. To, yes, who are getting yeah. in their way of approving the drug. Yeah, it's a little unclear why they'd kill Lentz, but, you know. Because he has the authority to see that they changed the samples. But wouldn't he be in, he? so he didn't change the samples? No. Okay, they're, so they're, they so use. are saying they're... Dr. Nichols is the only other one <laughs> who had access. So they use Lentz's connection to Sykes to hire Sykes. They Lentz is a ruse. Lentz is the, to let the audience think that somebody else was bu the the bad guy, mm -hmm. until we find out that Lentz wasn't the bad guy. Doctor Nichols was the bad guy. Right. You know. Like, okay. So, but the Doctor Nichols is using Lentz's connection with Sykes to hire Sykes. Oh, because Sykes is the guy in charge of Devlin McGregor security. Yeah. Right? So okay. they used so they, to they, wine they... and dine all the doctors. Yeah. So I, even though they were in the same picture, I don't think uh, Lentz was anything involved with this conspiracy. Okay. Well, he signed, he signed for half or, uh, or I guess less than half the samples before he died. Cause they said, they said like half, half were signed the day he died, which implies that, you know, he died and then they went and rushed the signatures right away because they couldn't verify it. But what about all the ones that were signed before then? I, I assume that he was somehow involved and maybe he asked for more money or something. Oh, that's and, interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. Then they offed him. I actually, yeah, I was under the impression that Lentz was just a victim of the circumstance. I didn't think, so you think that there's a, there, there, I mean, it's ambiguous, right? It's ambiguous if they were trying to off the person, but I have a feeling maybe my take was Lentz was on to the fact that they were switching the samples and that's why they got rid of him. I mean, it's, I think it's a detective story because it's a detective story with an action story, but the, the real mystery is not 
that important. It's sort of, um, it, it allows us to have a, a terminus point so that the fugitive has a goal beside, you know, just remaining a few, you know, remaining ahead of the law. So that once he figures this out, once he figures who it is, that's seen as kind of the, the finish line. Um, you know, in the original show was just kind of like, he could just run forever. And eventually they thought that might be not satisfying. And so they, they ended the show with him, you know, finding the one-armed man and all that. Um, but I think it's just, you know, the, the detective stuff. Uh, well, I think it is, it is fun. And it's also fun to watch him put the pieces together. He's a, you know, Kimball's is, is very clever in the way he does this. Um, it, it's also, uh, it, it's also a structural means for us to wait for something for him to solve this crime before Gerard gets him. It allows him to be competent and Gerard to be competent. This is why I asked the question though, because I've never had a forum and I thought our podcast was perfect for it to discuss this element because it really doesn't matter. But I thought it was kind of cool to just deep dive into it for a second after watching this film so many times to really see why did all this happen? It looks like Tom wins the episode with four points. Congratulations, Tom. Mm. <laughs> and the crowd rejoices. <laughs> it's time for Movie Rant. It looks like we didn't need a bonus question for this episode, but I had one ready just in case. And this one is very adjacent to our rules of not going outside of the film, but I thought there was enough evidence that everyone could have figured it out if I asked it. So I'm going to ask it anyway, and we'll just see uh, how it goes. How many potential love interest subplots were abandoned? Rightfully so. Oh, I, I, I'm going to go with three. I'm going to, can I say my three? Anyone or else? Everybody else I just that. want anyone else. It doesn't matter. Just for fun. <laughs> I can only think of two off the top of my head. I'm impressed. I can, I can only think of, uh, What's her name from? Oh, Magnolia oh, and uh, uh, Julianne Moore. Yeah, the 9 11 mm -hmm. movie. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to let Tom go. I only have two, so I want to hear uh, who Tom's third one is. Or all well, three are, but specifically. The first one we meet is the woman who picks him up right on the bridge, who they might have actually spent the night together, even in this movie. I remember when he's walking and that woman picks him up. Yes, that was not on my list. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, I do remember who you're talking about. When yeah, but they, they spend the night together, don't they? Isn't don't the cops talk about that? No, that's where they switch. They were talking about the other, the other fugitive, uh, Copeland. I think his name was. That was the whole setup. That you know. Oh, the okay. That, okay. They're closing All in right. on him, but they're mm. really getting Copeland. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Which I thought was well done. Mm. I liked that. Yeah. Um, so that, I didn't that, count one, that one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the, the other two were, uh, oh, uh, Janet Lynch, Jane, Jane, Jane Lynch? Lynch, Jane Lynch. Do you mean and, Dr. Kathy Walland? Sure. That's, that might, that might <laughs> oh, as well be from her name. Glee. Yeah. yeah. And then also Julianne Moore. Yes, Julianne Moore. When I was watching this movie, I noticed that Julianne Moore was fourth billing in the film, which made absolutely no sense to me because she is barely in the film. And it turns out there was a whole nother subplot where he then, Dr. Kimball then went back to her. There was a love interest, but they thought it wouldn't play out well as he's trying to avenge his wife's murder, which by the way, they were right. That probably wouldn't have been good. And there was also talk about making the, encounter with Jane Lynch's character, Dr. Kathy Walland, not platonic, but I think that was also better in a platonic fashion. Julianne Moore's character, not that it matters, was Dr. Anne Eastman. Yeah, she blew up right after this, right? I'm looking at her filmography now. Uh, she was- She was supposed to have a much larger role in this film. Nine right? months was 95. Oh, she was in- in right after this, uh, Vanya on 42nd Street, which is a movie we're going to do um, because it's a really good movie. <laughs> it has nothing to do with The Fugitive other than yearly proximity. But um, 
Yeah, she's. It's interesting to see a movie star before they're a movie star or when they're in a non-movie star role. The light just sort of hits them differently than it hits the rest of us. <laughs> but still, fourth billing, Tom. Like, she yeah, was supposed this was supposed to be her debut. Yeah, um, but uh, I think she's in shortcuts before this also. Uh, but and, and, you know, anyway, um, yeah, when she like kind of runs and stops him, it's just sort of you know, <laughs> it's such a it's sissy just, line too. It's just like. You stay right there. Yeah, but what else is she going to do? She well, they make fun of it in the movie. Five pounds. Yeah. She gonna now, Tommy Lee Jones makes fun of it you yeah. know, as well. But Yeah, but it, it's just, it's kind of fun to watch, you know, how different uh, movie stars are. <laughs> they just, yeah, they can, they can take the light in a different way. I just also wanted to point out uh, with that scene, Harrison Ford, uh, he makes the fake ID, uh, you know, he replaces his photo. But he doesn't bother to change the name. So he is, uh, let's see, I have it here, uh, Des Desmondo Jose Ruiz. <laughs> <laughs> I think he has a little bit of an accent, too, when he goes to clean the blinds. <laughs> an indistinct accent. Yeah, he his Spanish is is clearly... An you know, clearly an American accent with, with some Spanish words, uh, you know, laced onto it. Um, yeah, I, I suppose we could talk maybe a little bit also about the the probability of <laughs> of any of this working out particularly well for for Doctor Kimball. Um, I, I you could kind of trace the amount of times he would have been caught. I, I think coming out of the jail when he's interviewing the one armed man in in prison, Clive, I think his name is, and like he would have been caught in a second. I, I think there. Um, also, it's like this. It's ah, God. I think in the hospital he's also going to be caught. Um, I, I imagine like somebody knows who the janitors are, right? Like somebody hasn't. Has yeah, it's met a big these hospital. People. Yeah, I, I guess so. Or you know, it's also lucky that the room he went into had an unconscious old man in it who had food and a shaving kit ready. <laughs> <laughs> also, what I noticed too, the overalls from the can mechanic. It actually made me think back to our Halloween episode. That's how he got it to, except he killed the mechanic, <laughs> but uh, that's where the overalls come from or the, what are they called? Coveralls? I don't know. They're not overalls. Uh, yeah. I, I was also trying to imagine what would you do today um, on the run and you didn't have a cell phone and how much of life is only accessible via the, the cell phone, you know, that actually the cell phone would be the first thing, how they find you. They find you, but also like, how do you get into the hospital? Like you might have to check in with your cell phone to get into, you know, the areas you need to. In, oh, in the these hospital. are the days where you just walked right into a hospital. Nobody did yeah. anything. <laughs> yeah, I know. This pre 9-11 is a, is a is a crazy world, man. You just got on planes, walked into buildings. Um, yeah, things like that are uh, e even how much more promotion the police would be able to do with kind of your... Um, you know, with, with people having cell phones and whatnot. Also, what did you think of the strategy of letting him integrate into his life and not using the news media? That seemed to be something that Gerard did incorrectly, as far as I could tell. I don't know. I I only took it on the assumption that is some kind of police deputy marshal type strategy. <laughs> but he but later reneges, right? Because then he goes in front of the press. They're forced to because yeah. the word gets out. And so I don't think that that wasn't a conscious decision. Mm -hmm. What happened? There was a, an event. It was St. Patty's Day, right? He gets away. Yes. And, so and then yes. He... Well, they shoot. They shots are fired, so you can't really hide that as much. By are the way, fired? that Saint. Yes, when he's trying to escape the uh, police station, they shoot oh, at the glass. The glass. Yeah. Yeah. By mm -hmm. the way, that St. Patty's scene was completely done off the cuff. They had handheld cameras. They went into the crowds. They were all just kind of making it up as they went. And mm -hmm. they did get permission to go into the parade. But mm -hmm. that's why that scene looked, even with Tommy Lee G Jones jumping around, that was all just, hey, go out there and try to see if you can find him. It was interesting to hear how they shot that sequence. So one thing that was interesting, I, I, I didn't pick this up the first time I watched it, but being able to pause it, the newspaper uh, says that they captured him. Uh, at the St. Patrick's Day Parade. So th I guess this is like 
part of the whole news, like keeping you out of the news. So, um, so that's an interesting strategy. But they, but then they go on television and say they don't have him right after the St. Patty's Day Parade. Yeah, right? it's weird. I don't know if it's like a, a mistake, you know, making the movie like they thought they were mm-hmm. going to do one thing. But if you if you pause it on oh. the newspaper, it actually says that mm-hmm. he's been captured. I wonder if it's a mistake or if they're just saying trying to show that the misinformation in the media that they got a different story. But it could also have been that they changed how that played out. There was another scene where he's uh, coming out of the elevator. You guys remember he's in the elevator. I think he's on top of the elevator and then eventually he goes out of the elevator. Mm -hmm. And you see it from the outside of the elevator and he wraps his arm around to keep the door from closing and then he gets Mm -hmm. out. It reminded me a lot of battling burrows from um, Broken Blossoms coming through that. (laughs) Just that shot of, you know, from the outside of the elevator, Mm -hmm. we see him bust through without an axe or anything. Does Dr. Nichols turn in 360 degrees in the the elevator? No, another lost. Um, Another lost opportunity for an I think I think KJ would want that inserted into any movie. (laughs) What's a movie without that? This would have won Best Picture that year. Yeah, they, they that was that would have really Schindler's just. Down. Uh, yeah, that that's, was the thing. Let's be fair. That's tough competition. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's not true. enough battling burrows. Oh, um, okay. So I'm going to say this. I think that the ending on the rooftop and all that stuff kind of sucked. <laughs> I think watching like these two old men get into a fight that's more or less inconsequential because we already have the information, and then they just shoved in this. The cops are going to shoot you because they think he killed the cop even though he obviously didn't <laughs> like all the evidence indicates this other guy did um yeah i, I that that kind of didn't work <laughs> i was like well the, we're watching like an old dutch man fight another old guy <laughs> in a laundry room <laughs> this is not a this is not a convincing conclusion the element i did enjoy about that though was they fought like I would think two doctors with no fighting experience would fight. So yeah. I don't know if that was just yeah. meant to be or a lucky coincidence. <laughs> but that's goes- how I took it. It was very met. It was very deep, you know? <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was like, it, it was like, yeah, two guys who like, it, it's, you know, a white collar fight, right? They just, they do the thing where they, they really pull their arms back and whatnot. They seem tired, but it also you never give forever. up, do you? <laughs> yeah. Like they run onto the rooftop, they fall into the elevator. Um, you know, then the, then the, the Dutch guy decides he's going to like knock out the cops in order to you know protect his good name because apparently this strategy is going to work really well um i yeah i I thought that whole ending was kind of you know uh i'll let down i'll say anybody sit through the end credits oh no was there a was there something well not really but so I, i sat through the end credits and normally or even in this time so it's black and there's names scrolling up but at the very end like when it's like you know, made by Panasonic or, you know, you get that little mm-hmm. globe there. It's not black anymore. It's a shot of Chicago's high rises with fireworks playing. And then I rewinded, like I, I, I went back cause I, it was, it didn't make sense. I was like, no, no, you don't do that. You leave it black for that end scene. And I, I thought I dreamt it or something, but I'm pretty sure the last, last credits is a shot of Chicago. Yeah. With fireworks with fireworks. Huh. I'm gonna have to go back and, and it kind of sneaks up. That. I mean, it's it's yeah. a Chicago movie. I, I it does feel very much like a Chicago movie. It feels like the city in the way when you see like a Scorsese movie and like it feels like a New York movie, even if you've never been to New York. There's a sense of place, and there there really is a, a really nice sense of place about you know about the city. Well, Andrew Davis is from Chicago, so he has a connection. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. You could kind of feel it. Um, and they didn't do the thing which usually makes a movie clearly not familiar with that place, which is go to the landmark and shoot the thing at the landmark. Mm. You know, like how like uh, you know, lots and lots of important scenes keep happening in Yankee Stadium for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> like they, they happen at the Empire State Building and then after that, everybody just goes to Yankee Stadium as if those two things are, are near each other. Um, th- this movie didn't do that. Instead, you know, it, it felt uh, the... the places we saw were kind of residential and um fairly casual to to not so nice with the exception of the hotel wrap this one up 
I just wanted to say how I like the ending of the film, not the part that Tom's talking about, but when they just kind of drive off and leave it ambiguous. We know that he didn't do it. We assume that he's going to you know, get acquitted for all his, all his crimes and whatnot. But the funny thing is, if this happened in real life, just because he was innocent doesn't mean he wouldn't face any other prosecution because he committed a lot of crimes, including robbery and like identity theft and document forgery. So just because he escaped doesn't mean he's free and clear here if it was real. I might give him time served. Yeah. But I'll take it. <laughs> uh, one, one question I, I have uh, from the very beginning is why does Nichols need to borrow his car? <laughs> Doesn't he have his own car? The keys. He has to. He has to give the keys to Sykes. Yes. Yeah, so, so that's why there's no. But, but, break no, I don't think that's for, why. I think he's oh. saying like, why does he need to borrow his car? Yeah, like in general. <laughs> yeah, he's because his oh, car was his his car was in the shop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think they may have addressed it in the beginning sequence when he gives him back the keys. It's actually we we see that very early on in that party. Mm -hmm. He does. There is some kind of dialogue there, but you're right. It's kind of orchestrated perfectly so that we can have this series of events. Yeah. It's also, why are his house keys? Why does he give him his house keys as well as the car keys? You know, that's, that's common. <laughs> that's common. That's common if it's on the same key ring. Even, yeah, but even if he's not going back to, the... into his own house, <laughs> or right, how many, right, right. many sets of keys? He it's... knew he was going to see him at the party. I, I'm just, you know, <laughs> craftsman. Trust. I personally separate them if I drop it off as a mechanic or something. But maybe it's because I watched The Fugitive. I don't know. But why? But so if we look at the plot, right, uh, or the plot that that Nichols had in mind, which is to get Sykes to break in and kill Kimball, why would he want it not to look like a break in? But right? it's pure accident that that it looks like Kimball killed his wife. Other than the, maybe the security system, because right? there's a security system, and maybe that gets that's what they need to worry about. But like, if, if like the cops come and go, like, and and like Kimball's dead, it's like okay. So there's no forced entry. So the person who got into the apartment knew Kimball. Wouldn't that be a problem for for Nichols? Don't forget Sykes' plan went awry. So who knows if he was going to make it look like a robbery after the fact. So I'm I'm giving them that leniency <laughs> that it would tie yeah, in. That's the that's, only thing that I, I I don't know if that yeah. was by design. Yeah, I think there's an alarm system too. So yeah, though that's what yeah. I said. The 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 alarm makes sense, but still, there's a there's a bit of a problem there, right? I mean, if you well, like, hey, this guy theoretically, he could have killed Doctor Kimball, mm -hmm. then make the scene look like it was a robbery, smack mm -hmm. the alarm on the way out, and get out. So. I, yeah. I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. There, there is a way that could have worked out. Why did Doctor Nichols give Harrison Ford money in that one scene? I, why wouldn't he? Because he doesn't want Harrison Ford to figure this out. It's for our sake, right? So we don't know he's the bad guy. <laughs> yeah, that's the reality. We it's don't know really he's the bad nice. Guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to him, I don't think he sees it as detrimental to himself because he doesn't know that he's on this following these breadcrumbs on this path to figure out that he's the bad guy yeah but every advantage goes to nichols if harrison ford goes back to jail yeah yeah i, I mean he get, I, you know he tells the cops about it and or the marshals about it and he only gives them a few dollars I, you know i think he gave him I, I more know. than he said because he, all of a sudden he's able to rent an apartment and all. I think it was more money than we think. Than he told. Yeah. I thought he was like misleading the cops. Yeah. Well, I guess then it's for our sake. Well, it's definitely for our sake, but a, a basement apartment under you know rented by a drug dealer. So, <laughs> um, but but another thing I was thinking of is, is it might be uh, to Nichols' advantage if uh, uh, if Kimball just gets away. He might, you know, he, he might not think he, he's actually tracking down uh you know what happened and trying to prove his innocence he might he might think he's just trying to get enough money to get out and 
if he escapes, you know, uh, as, as opposed to getting incarcerated and filing appeals and potentially uncovering things that way, you know, with lawyers and, and stuff, um, you know, if he, if he gets out, you know, maybe he actually has less of a chance of actually figuring out, uh, you know, what happened. And I don't know, it's a, it's a theory. Doug, that's how I took it as well, was he thought he was less of a threat if he's on the street versus behind bars. So that I, I that's how I, I never really questioned yeah. that further. But that's exactly why we have this podcast, to dig into what is Provasic and why did he give him money? <laughs> and we learned about arteries, too. It was educational. <laughs> do, you, do you guys ever read about the real case that this is based on? The Dr. Shepard case? It's interesting. I saw like a, a documentary on it. And the, the television show is based on the case of a, a doctor who went to jail for killing his wife. And the guy claimed another person was there. Um, and then he fought with the person on, they had a home on a beach and, you know, fought with him onto the beach. And then the guy got away and it was in the, you know, the fifties or the sixties. And it was this huge travesty of justice. Like the, the judge would not allow the doctor to have a lawyer um, and, or present evidence <laughs> for his case. Wow. Um, the doctor was, the doctor was kind of a, a dirt bag. He was kind of having affairs with different women. He wasn't a particularly good guy. Um, but you know, they still treated him badly. And then he claimed to have, you know, hurt this guy. And this is before DNA evidence. And years later, they, um, is exhumed his body and tested the blood that was at the scene. And there was a third person's blood at the crime scene. There was him, his wife and a third person, um, who, you know, so this guy was covered in another person's blood they found out later. And so they think that, yeah, this guy was actually innocent. Um, and actually a, uh, a person who was um, uh, criminally insane had uh, escaped from a mental asylum around the same time the wife was murdered <laughs> and was out and about during that time. So it's a really interesting story, but it's, it's incredibly upsetting because it was just, uh, th this man doesn't have a, didn't have a particularly good reputation as a, you know, just as a guy, as a husband and as a member of the community. And there was just sort of, um, that was, and for that reason, it was assumed he was just guilty. And, you know, like evidence. And I remember like an interview with the juror. They had one of the jurors and the juror says, I don't care about evidence. I said he did it. Therefore, he did it. You're like, oh, well, <laughs> good to know, buddy. <laughs> but yeah, that was the, the original case, um, you know, that this this came from. Um, so I, I looked I looked at that briefly. I didn't read the whole thing, but um, I, I saw that after he was exonerated, uh, this is the real guy. He, he actually went back to practicing medicine um, and he killed two people uh, by cutting arteries or something. Um, and uh, and then I guess like, you know, lost his license and, and I think he died shortly after that. So that's pretty messed up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think he was like a kind of a dirt bag and like, like you're saying, like an incompetent doctor also. Um, but he's still, you know, he might be a terrible doctor and a bad husband, but he's not a murderer. <laughs> well, well, he wasn't that. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess you're, you're a killer, not a murderer, yeah. right? Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd like to once again, congratulate our winner of the week, Tom. Good job, Tom. It was a good job. <laughs> <laughs> On another note, Check out our website, TalkingPicturesTrivia.com, for more information about us and our episodes. You can find us wherever you listen to podcasts as well as our YouTube channel. We are extremely grateful for any positive reviews as those help others like you find us. If you like what you hear, remember to like and subscribe to our show. Do you think Dr. Kimball still would have served jail time at the end of this film? And if so, how much? Let's continue the conversation on Twitter at Talking Studios. Thanks again, Doug, for joining us today. Where can people find you? I'm at Doug underscore Ewan on Twitter. I'm at Thomas Lehman 15 on Twitter. And you can find me on Twitter at KJ1000. I can also be found on Twitter at The Nicknamed. Join us next time when we continue our series on Best Picture nominees with KJ's recommendation from 1999, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Should be a fun one. Talk to you then. Ding, 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 ding. 
right? There's a lot of times where Harrison's, there's a lot of times where Harrison's Ford, old man, that boyish look. Did I try to, did I do it wrong again? Harrison, Harrison Ford, Ford. Harrison Ford was <laughs> driving down the road. And there's a lot of time where Harrison Ford, there's a lot of time when Harrison, Harrison Ford's, it's the possessive it's. There's a lot of time when Ford's old man yet boyish look During all this, Steven Spielberg releases Jurassic Park. But today we are talking about Craig Brewer's The Fugitive. Craig Brewer has directed Steven Seagal in Above the Law and Under Siege. And with two Steven Seagal movies under his belt, Craig went on to direct The Fugitive, which was nominated for Best Picture. Nick, what is The Fugitive all about? Thanks, KJ. And you are right. Sorry, I interrupt. Yes. <laughs> um, I think it's Andrew Davis is the director. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> it is Andrew Davis. Really? It that is kills Andrew so Davis. much of this. <laughs> what did I click on? No. Uh, <laughs> where did I get Andrew Davis? <laughs> Who's Craig Brewer? <laughs> I don't even know. 